This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Okay, it's time we looked at um, company law meetings and resolutions, and we're going to start with general meetings. With well, we're going to start with meetings uh, because there are two types of meeting that involve members of a company. There are general meetings and there are class meetings where we have a company with different classes of share capital. Then every now and then it's necessary to hold a class meeting, basically to determine what the members of that particular class want to happen into the future. Typically, it will be because there is a proposal to change the class rights of, those, uh, of the members of that particular class, and they have to give their approval. But class meetings pass resolutions that are not binding on the company. If it's just a class meeting of the cumulative preference shareholders, then fine, they resolve what they would like to happen. But the, the company is not bound. It's a majority of the equity shareholders that will bind the company into entering into contracts, transactions, or going on into the future. So we have class meetings, we have general meetings. With reference to general meetings, there are two kinds. There's the annual general meeting, and there are other general meetings that are not the annual general meeting. And these are literally called other general meetings. And the first thing to be said is that public companies have to have an annual general meeting. And they have to have one every year. Now remember, a public company is one where the constitution states that it's public, and the name finishes with the letters PLC, and it has a minimum uh, allotted share capital of £50,000 or euro equivalent, of which at least 25% has been credited as paid up, together with the whole of any premium, and, and that's the definition of a public company. Nowhere in that definition does it require that that public company shall be a quoted company on a recognised stock exchange. So we do have public companies that are not quoted. Nevertheless, they still must hold an annual general meeting. But that differs from private companies. Private companies do not need, they are not required to have an annual general meeting. They may do if they wish, and they may do if the required proportion of members requests that an annual general meeting shall be held. But otherwise, there's no need for annual general meetings. The same way the private companies have no need for auditors either. So annual general meetings, we're back again here. Every public company must hold one, and they must hold one every year. Now, there was a case called Gibson and Barton, where there was a, a request given to the court, if the, the problem came to court, where the court had to decide what did it mean in statute when it said that an annual general meeting had to be held every year. And the court decided that where it said every year, it meant every calendar year. So there is our basis. There has to be, for a public company, an annual general meeting held at least once in every calendar year. But then the rules go on, because it also says the first is no more than 18 months after incorporation. That is not strictly so. It actually says in the Act that the first shall be held no more than six months after the first accounting reference date. Now, these notes have suggested that the first accounting reference date will be 12 months, and therefore the first annual general meeting will be within 18 months of incorporation. But as I say, strictly, that's not true. Doesn't matter for our purposes, it's unlikely that that little twist is going to be asked within an exam. Well, that's when the first one shall be held. What about others? Well, subsequent shall be held no more than 15 months after the previous one was held. So there we have it. 18 months is the maximum time. Again, that's not strictly true, but we'll move on. 18 months is the maximum period between incorporation and the first annual general meeting, and then a further 15 months beyond that. So just for interest, Let's say that we have a company that was incorporated on 1st of May 2014. Can you tell me what is the latest date that this company 
may hold its second annual general meeting. Just think about that. Just get a scrap of paper and work it out. The latest date on which this public company may hold its second annual general meeting. Okay. Well, the first one, the first AGM annual general meeting, must be held no more than 18 months after incorporation or six months after the first year end date, the first accounting reference date. So 18 months after May, I'm going to use my fingers because otherwise I do get confused. So I've got May, the end of May, June, July, August, September, October. So 31 October 2015, isn't it? 2015. It's the latest date that the company may hold its first annual general meeting. Its second annual general meeting shall be no more than 15 months after that. So the second AGM is going to be on the 31st of, do I hear you say January 2016? Did that, is that what you said? Because 31st January 2016. 17, you might have said, 31st January 2017, where's your annual general meeting to be held in 2016? You've missed a year. The latest it can hold its second AGM is 31st December 2016. So now it's got an AGM in 15, and it's got an AGM in 16, and that will satisfy the legal requirement of having an annual general meeting in each calendar year. It's a little trick, it's a little gimmicky for you, and, and it's a bit of fun, but it may possibly be asked in an F4 multiple choice question. So subsequent, no more than 15 months after previous, private company members, I've already covered that, private company members may ask, that a meeting shall be held, an annual general meeting shall be held. But I would imagine that that's quite unusual on the basis that general, annual general meetings incur expense and for a private company it's an unnecessary expense. But it could happen and there are some very, very, very large private companies that you would imagine, probably just looking at their public persona and their reputation, you would think instantly that these companies were public companies and probably quoted, but no, they don't have to be. It could be a very substantial private company just because it doesn't satisfy the definition of being a public company. Annual general meetings are requiring 21 days notice, so the company will clear days notice. So the board will contact the secretary or instruct the secretary to send out notice of a meeting with at least 21 clear days notice before the date of the meeting, not including the date the notice is served and the date of the meeting. So you've got 21 days clear notice to be given to the members, to all the members, accidental omissions to give a member notice out of 15,000 members. It could be that one member has changed address and not notified the company and therefore doesn't get notification of the annual general meeting. Accidental omissions like that, not a big problem. There, there was a case involving Canadian collieries, collieries and a box file of address, addressogram plates was accidentally missed. But it was an accident and the notice of the meeting was sent to all the other members. It was just that this one box was missed. So you can imagine you can't. You've got all these boxes and, and they're putting them through on the addressogram machine. We're talking old fashioned here. Putting them through on the addressogram machine, putting them back in the box, moving it to one side. Then you get the next box and then it's lunchtime. So you go away for lunchtime. You come back and you've got this box in front of you, so you move it on one side, and that's the box that didn't get put through the addressogram machine. The purpose of an annual general meeting is primarily to discuss and, if thought fit, to approve ordinary business. Now, ordinary business is specifically defined within company legislation. It's the, that business, with ordinary business, 
that may be conducted at an annual general meeting without any notice being given of the resolutions to be proposed. The general meeting still has to have 21 days notice, but there's no need to specify the detail of the resolutions on the agenda. All you have to do is say, notice is hereby given of an annual general meeting to be held here at this time on that date. The purpose of the meeting is to discuss and if thought fit to pass the ordinary business that may normally be transacted at a company's annual general meeting. Now, I have seen that once in the financial accounts of a company called Ultramar Corporation, which now no longer exists. And they said the purpose of the business is to discuss the ordinary business that may be discussed at an annual general meeting. That's all they had to say, but they didn't. They went further and said, that is specifically, and then they listed out the four resolutions only four resolutions are classified as being ordinary business. And they're here for you in the notes. Now remember that when notice of the meeting was sent out by the secretary by order of the board, not on behalf of, by order of the board, the secretary sends out the financial statements together with the notice of the meeting to be held and the agenda for that meeting. Those financial statements are sent out no later than 21 clear days before the meeting is to be held. So one of the first things, the ordinary business, is to say to the shareholders that are present, the chairman will lead the meeting, the chairperson, I'm sorry, will lead the meeting, and they'll say, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. Welcome to the 119th annual general meeting of the blah, 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 PLC. The purpose of the meeting is to discuss and if thought fit to approve the following resolutions. You've all received a copy of the financial statements, they were sent out to you some three and a half weeks ago. You've had the chance to read them, look at them, approve them. What we do now need is we need your formal presentation of these financial statements. The directors approve them on behalf of the, the, the board, on behalf of the, the members, but the members have to formally accept or formally receive a formal presentation of the financial statements, the annual accounts. The second element of ordinary business is the reappointment of directors. The reappointment of, of directors serving for another year. Directors um, are retire by rotation, and, oh dear, unless it's an FTSE 350 company. An FTSE, Financial Times Stock Exchange, 350, the top 350 companies, they, uh, those companies, the directors of those companies, must retire every annual general meeting and, if they wish, submit themselves for re-election. But it only applies to the first 350, the top 350. Others can, other PLCs, you could find that they voluntarily choose to retire at the end of annual, every annual general meeting and submit themselves for re-election. And that is ordinary business, to re-elect. And the emphasis there is to the re bit, the reappointment. It's not the appointment of a new director, because that wouldn't be ordinary business. And it's not the removal of a director. And it's not the uh, replacement of a director. This is the reappointment of an existing director for another year. And that is ordinary business. The third element of ordinary business is the reappointment of auditors. And again, we're in the same situation. The emphasis is on re appointment. They have already served a complete year and now we're reappointing them for another complete year. If they haven't completed a full year, if they were only elected part way through this last year, then they haven't completed a full year and therefore they, their reappointment does not get classified as ordinary business. So it's the reappointment for another year of the auditors is classed as ordinary business. And finally, the approval of the dividend that has been proposed by the directors. The directors, when they are approving these financial statements, they've already been prepared, the chief financial officer and the accountancy team, the finance department has prepared the financial statements. And these are presented by probably by the chief financial officer to the board of directors and then says, oh, have we had a super year? But now we have to think about what dividend to propose 
as being payable to the members. So the directors will discuss it and they'll all sort it out and they'll say, well, last year we paid two cents in the dollar, two cents per share. This year we ought to increase it. Shall we increase it 10%? We'll pay 2.2 cents per share this year. So the directors will um, propose the dividend that they feel should be uh, approved by the members. But it is not yet a liability. It's not yet an obligation of the company. And it only becomes an obligation when the members at the annual general meeting listen to the directors as they propose this, this dividend to be paid, ladies and gentlemen, this year, because we've had a good year, we're proposing that a dividend of 2.2 cents per share shall be paid. We need to have your approval, all those in favour, and hands will go up, and all those against, and maybe one or two hands will go up. And they, that's the approval of the dividend. Now, it's interesting because the members may say, whoa, directors, that's too much. We need to hold some money back in the company in order that we can finance expansion. So the members may say, no, 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 to discuss and if thought fit to approve the dividend of 2.2. No, we think that's too much. In fact, we want it to be less than last year. 1.9 cents per share is sufficient. Last year we had two. Let's drop it to 1.9 and that way we can keep some money back in the company to finance the expansion. Now that can happen at the annual general meeting. So the members can discuss and reduce the level of the proposed dividend that the directors have proposed. What they can't do is they can't increase, they can't turn to the directors and say, why have we made all these distributable profits. Why have we got all these retained earnings? Why do we not have a bigger dividend? We want 2.4 uh, cents per share. Now, they're not allowed to do that in an annual general meeting. Yet, If that were sufficient demand of the members, then the directors would have to reconvene another general meeting in order to approve this increased dividend demanded by the shareholders. But that's another, never heard of it happening. And I can't believe that there will be shareholders that say, no, 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 please, that's too much. Don't pay me 2.2 cents per share. I only want 1.9. Give me less than I got last year. I can't believe that that happens, but in theory, it is available. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that, those four, are ordinary business. The ordinary business that may be transacted at a public company's annual general meeting without any specific detailed notification being given. You do not need any day's notice to be given. Just, here's the annual general meeting, we're going to have it, and we're going to pass ordinary business, we're going to discuss ordinary business. If it's not ordinary business, if there's anything else on there, if it's not ordinary business, then by definition, by statutory definition, it must be special business. The statute actually says the special business is any business that isn't ordinary business. And ordinary business is defined. And there it is. Those are the four elements of ordinary business. So if it's not one of those, then it must be special. If it's appointing a new director, and it's therefore not a reappointment, or if the director was appointed part way through the year that's just finished, then they must submit themselves for re-election by special business. So it's only ordinary business if you're re-electing, re-appointing an existing director for another complete year, having already served a complete year. Same with the auditors. If it's a new firm of auditors appointed part way through, then that's not ordinary business, that's special business. So ordinary, I'm emphasizing this because students get totally, horribly upset and confused by this. Ordinary business is these four. The formal presentation of the financial statements, the reappointment of directors for another full year, the reappointment of auditors for another full year, and the approval of the dividend that was proposed by the directors. And that's the only business at an annual general meeting that falls within the definition of being 
ordinary business. And all that ordinary business, that's passed by resolution of the members. And it's an ordinary resolution. It's just one more vote in favour than votes against. So there's no special majority needed. It's just, does the majority of the votes cast support the resolution? I mentioned their resolution. There are three types. There are actually, for public comments, there's only two. But basically, there are three types. And we'll get rid of the third one straight away, because it only applies to private companies. And it's a written resolution. If you imagine open tuition, we live around the world. Tax tutor lives in the Far East. I live in the deep south of, of Europe. Ken lives way over in Spain. John's up in the Baltic States. Chris is in the UK. So we're all over the place. Can you imagine having an annual general meeting as a private company? Imagine having an annual general meeting to pass resolutions where we have electronic communication and Skype and, and, and group internet conferences. Can you imagine us all having to travel into either the UK or the Baltic? So can no. So what can happen is that the Open Tuition Secretary could write out the resolutions and circulate them, either one each, send them each us each a copy, or send the first one to the Far East and, and Colin will approve it and forward it to me and I'll forward it on to Ken and Ken will forward it on to the, the Baltics. Can you imagine that that's substantially easier having it in writing and it would be um, certainly less expensive than if we all had to travel to one central point. So that's written resolutions. And the written resolution can be used for any resolution, for any business, ordinary business, special business, business that requires special resolutions, business that doesn't require special resolutions, business that requires special notice, where any resolution at all it can be passed by a private company, but only private company, it can be passed by a private company by the availability of doing that resolution in writing. And the resolution is deemed to have been approved and passed when the required majority has passed it. So if we're, if we're thinking about John and Chris and Ken and me and Colin, if you may imagine that, and say we each have equal shareholdings, and then when we send this, this written resolution out and, and Colin approves and I disapprove and Ken approves and John approves, that's three. And we've not yet heard from Chris. That's three voting in favour and one voting against. Well, even if Chris votes against, it's going to be a three in favour, two against. So the resolution is approved with effect from the date that the majority is reached. So private companies only, any resolution order or special, except for the removal, there's the exception. And I'll come to that exception when we're looking at, at ordinary resolutions with special notice. So I'll talk more about the exception when we get to this ordinary resolutions with special notice. But otherwise, just remember, if it's a written resolution and we're proposing the removal of an auditor or the removal of a director, that resolution, particularly the audit one, that resolution has to be approved by the auditors before it can be done by way of a written resolution. So the auditor needs to approve the wording. Resolution is passed with effect from the date that the required majority is reached. Now, that only applies to private companies. So now let's get back to, and it doesn't have to be, they don't have to pass resolutions in writing. It can be done in the ordinary way at a general meeting. And so we now have these two particular types of resolution. Now remember, we've already had special business. And when we look at liquidations, ooh, way ahead. When we look at liquidations, there's a person called a special manager. So that's two specials. We've got special business, special manager. And now in front of us, we have special resolution. And I've already very quickly mentioned special notice um, for the removal of an, uh, an auditor or director. That type of resolution requires special notice. So there are four specials involved. Don't confuse them. Special business is any business that isn't ordinary business. Special manager will look at in greater detail when we get to liquidations. Special resolutions are coming up here, 75% majority, 14 days notice. 
certain items within the statute, within company law, require a majority to vote in favour greater than a simple one more vote in favour than votes against. And 75% is a typical one. There can be the articles, the Constitution can require some resolutions to be passed with 66%, 70%, 95%. But a special resolution is defined in law as being one that requires a 75% majority. Now just think about this before I get into to the detail of that. Are we looking here at 87.5% vote in favour and 12.5% voting against, giving us a difference of 75%? Is that what is meant by a 75% majority? No. The Act actually says that a special resolution is a resolution that is passed by a majority of not less than 75% of the people voting in favour of the resolution at a meeting of which not less than 21 days notice has been given specifying the intention to propose the resolution as a special resolution. So that's what it said, that's what it did say. The requirement of days notice now is only 14 days. So if you're having an other general meeting then you need only give 14 days notice of the special resolution. If you're passing a special resolution at an annual general meeting we know already that an annual general meeting requires 21 days notice so when you're sending out the notice of the annual general meeting you might as well at the same time send the notice of the special resolution. So in effect a special resolution will likely have 21 days notice, but it only needs 14. So now we've had, that's, that's not, so that's wrong. A majority of 75% is a majority of not less than 75% voting in favour, and therefore you can have up to 25% voting against, but nevertheless the resolution will still have been approved and will still be passed. Okay. Then we have the ordinary resolutions. We did incidentally have a couple of examples of special resolutions, didn't we? Alteration of the articles requires a special resolution. Changing the name of the company requires a special resolution. So there are situations that we've already covered that do require special resolutions. You will not be asked in F4 what type of resolution is needed for this, this, this or this. You will not be asked to list the special resolutions, those resolutions that are required to be passed by a 75% majority, that will not be asked in F4, nor in any other accountancy exam. Which leaves us now with ordinary resolutions. Now, we've got a bit of fun with ordinary resolutions, because we've already had the concept of ordinary business. And that requires no day's notice, but you give 21 days notice at the annual general meeting. No days notice, a majority greater than one, a majority voting, one or more, vote in favour than votes against. So that's ordinary business. If it's an ordinary resolution, which isn't ordinary business, that would be the appointment or the reappointment of a director who was appointed part way through the year. The reappointment of a director that was appointed halfway through the year, now retiring at this next annual general meeting, submitting himself or herself for re election. That re election is by ordinary resolution, but it's not ordinary business, therefore, it's special business. So an ordinary resolution that isn't, I'll come to, that isn't ordinary business may require only three days notice. And again, it's a simple majority. Then we have ordinary resolutions with special notice. And these are, these are unusual situations, these are not strange in any way, but they are of such interest that the notice period is special. 
and we'll come to that a little bit later on. But an order resolution with special notice has got two notice periods involved. The company has to be given 28 days notice. So the person requesting the resolution or a director wanting to propose the resolution has to tell the company at the company's registered office deposit a requisition in writing that says to the company secretary, I want to include this resolution in the agenda for the next annual general meeting. And that has to be no later than 28 days before the annual general meeting. As soon as the company secretary receives this, then the company secretary has to give the special notice to the director or auditor that is affected because they, there are five situations and they all involve either a director or an auditor. And we'll come to the specific reasons in a moment or two. So 21 days notice is then sent to the members. So our director tells the company no later than 28 days before. The company secretary tells the affected director or auditor immediately. The director or auditor then is able and entitled to write out their defence as to why, for instance, they shouldn't be removed. They submit that to the company. The company then has to distribute that to all the members no later than 21 days before the general meeting where this ordinary resolution is going to be heard and discussed and if thought fit it's going to be approved. So we have these ordinary resolutions with special notice but it's an ordinary resolution and it requires a majority of one more vote in favour and votes against. It's the notice period that is special. So that's where we have ordinary resolutions. It can be no days if it's ordinary business, but if it's not ordinary business, it's special business. If it's an ordinary resolution special business, and then that requires no less than three, but typically it will be notified with the notice of the meeting, 21 days notice, and therefore, in practical terms, the ordinary resolution, ordinary resolution special business, will normally get 21 days notice with the notice convening the general meeting. If it's ordinary resolution special business requiring special notice, and then 28 days notice has to be given to the company at the registered office. Immediately that notification is given to the affected director or auditor. They have seven days in which to submit their written representations to the company and the company secretary will then distribute these written representations together with the notice of the meeting and maybe the financial statements as well. Depends what sort of meeting it is. Okay, that's ordinary resolutions. Simple majority, one more vote in favour and votes against. Ordinary business and some special business. Well, not all special business is ordinary resolution because by definition, the business requiring a special resolution is not ordinary business and therefore it's special business. So some special business and 14 days notice is the uh, requirement, but because it will be likely heard and discussed at an annual general meeting, then it will be 21 days, the notice of the meeting. 14 days would be the notice period if it were an other general meeting. You may want to think again about this because I mentioned very briefly, I've mentioned special manager and I said I promised you that will look greater detail at special managers when we look at liquidation. But now what we also have is special business, and that is therefore any business, but not by definition, ordinary business. So I have special business. Then we've got special resolutions which by definition must be special business because it's not ordinary business. And special resolutions required for things like changing names, and changing the articles, alteration of the articles. Those are special uh, resolution requirements. Those are resolutions that are required to be passed by a 75% majority with not less than 14 days notice. 
And then we've also got special notice, and special notice, listen, special notice only ever applies to resolutions that are ordinary and only ever applies to ordinary resolutions for five matters, just five matters. And of those five, one is about directors and the other four relate to auditors. And it's only those five ordinary resolutions, with special business, because it's not ordinary business, ordinary resolutions requiring special notice. You may want to try to get your head around these four different specials because they can be confusing. Special resolutions, special business, special notice, those, they can be confusing and historically generations of students have found it tricky.